Hi. Uh, yeah, the, the Global Information Infrastructure Commission was actually the first um, uh, internet policy group. It was started by the World Bank and the G7 in the mid-1990s. And uh, many of the people um, who were involved there have since gotten older and retired. And a few years ago, the new incoming chairman asked me to help kind of rebuild the organization. So you can check out the website. And you can see we're still in a rebuilding mode. But, but some very interesting things have happened with that organization. Um, I'm also a Bell Labs fellow. I spent uh, 10 years at Belcor, 15 years at Bell Labs. And um, I, I do a number of strategic advisory services for startup tech startups. Um, and some of that's related to robotics and AI, which I'm going to talk about today. Um, I mentioned here also as a, uh, as a uh, description of myself is I'm not a science fiction guy because a lot of stuff I'm about to talk about is like really seems like impossible. Um, and yet I, I come to the conclusion that this is worth talking about just because analyzing the trends and what's happening. So I want to make it clear, like I, I have not seen almost all the science fiction movies everybody else has seen out there. I'm just, I'm just interested in reality a lot more than that. And I come to this at, just from the reality of what's, what we're, we're experiencing right now. Um, next slide. Do I, am I doing that? Oh, yeah, right here. There we go. So cloud ro uh, ro robotics, what, is, uh, what are cloud ro robotics? Well, uh, cloud robots are machines that are going to be doing things that we don't want to do and doing things that we can't do, so they could do things better than we could do, kind of like a calculator could do, you know, very complex division that, you know, we can't do that easily. Um, and also, we'll be able to add skills to our cloud robots in a similar way that we add apps to our phones now. And um, th these robots will learn from the experience of their peers, of other cloud-connected robots, and so will constantly become more valuable uh, once they're put in place. And there's the vision of some people who have invested an awful lot in this place that maybe they'd be around 10 years from now, perhaps like a lot of other technologies, you know, maybe it'd be 20 years. But it seems like everything is kind of in place and all the problems can be solved to, to actually make this kind of stuff happen. Um, I was actually there in Grand Rapids, Michigan in 1990 when the first voice recognition um, application was made. It was made to replace the operators for collect calls. The circuits were turned on. It was we were like 3 o'clock in the morning, and the first call came in from the airport somewhere around 5.30. Some guy called home collect, and his wife was kind of groggy in bed and answered and uh, said you know, yes to a, a prompt to say, well, you can accept this call. Never realized she just made history. We weren't able to record their names for privacy. But um, I was involved in evaluating whether or not this would be s sufficient. The big concern back then was would an inmate call a potential witness in the Michigan bill or in any other operating company be responsible for connecting a threatening, you know, conversation to a potential witness. So that was the, and it wasn't perfect, but how do we establish the criteria? It never existed before. So I was involved in that process. And so I've been watching voice recognition um, capabilities for a long time. And um, so we've, we've come a long way um, in that regard. Um, the term cloud robotics was uh, coined by a fellow at, uh, from the Pennsylvania University um, uh, known as Carnegie Mellon, and uh, he's now the CEO of Toyota's Research Institute. And, and uh, so it's very interesting if you're following this concept of, you know, and there's a cloud, of course, there's edge, there's fog stuff, but the, main, the, the capacity to have something um, in the cloud is, is, uh, is very powerful. And um, if you're going to take something away from this talk, um, at a person, it's like about three and a half pounds. And it runs on 40 watts. The equivalent of that logic is, would take 2,000 tons of silicon, not counting any metal or anything, just silicon. And it'd be running on 40 million watts. And so the point here is that you can't have that brain that's human-like with the body of the robot. Wouldn't fit size-wise, would weigh too much, and would be way too hot, would run on way too much power. Okay, now if you want to dive into this, it has to do the difference between electrons and ions and the power equation. You, maybe you're squaring current, and um, you know, that's why you get a million times difference because of the, the amount of current that's associated with it. So if you look at the power equation. Um, um, in fact, there's an article by uh, Bill Huang, former Bell Labs colleague, um, He's also a commissioner of GIIC, 
but it's a very short article in Scientific American. He goes into some of this, uh, some of the, the basic physics behind why, um, you know, the brain, a computer, uh, a, a robot brain would need to be, you know, displaced from the body of the robot. That really cool stuff you see with Boston Dynamics, there's usually a guy standing about 10 feet away with some kind of controller controlling it. The robots are really impressive mechanically, but they're really dumb. They can't hardly do anything by themselves. It's the intelligence, you know, you're really pretty much limitless once you go into the cloud. Um, and so, um, in the fastest part of the brain is vision. In fact, your um, part of your eye is actually part of your brain, you know, part of the, with, with, what's going on with your eye. Um, and because we could achieve, you know, pretty much real vision with, you know, being transported across networks with 4G and such, you know, we pretty much solve the abilities to, to communicate at this fastest rate as a human brain does. Um, the, the cloud robots will have a huge demand uh, for, for bandwidth. You can imagine multiple vision streams. Um, while we're sleeping, cloud robots will be active. Um, and it'll be bi-directional activity going on. The value will be extremely high. Imagine a robot that has all these different job functions, right? A maid, a chef, a concierge, gatekeeper, nanny. Um, the value of that, you know, probably, and it looks like the economics are such, that be like a, a cheap car, maybe 25, 30,000, maybe rental models at 15,000 a month. But you could have all kinds of services performed. So the economics will really be driven, most likely of anything in 5G, um, by, um, uh, you know, cloud robotics again. And I have this disclaimer in the lower left, of course, this may be wishful thinking, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a reluctant uh, convert, if to quote C.S. Lewis. I just think a lot of facts are, are pointing in this direction. It just might just happen. Um, now, we're having these lightning rounds. You really can't have Q&A, but um, I did some Q&A last night at one of the receptions and asked people when they asked me what I was talking about today, they had some questions. Uh, one of the staff here at PTC said, you know, will these robots hurt me? And, well, you know, it's like your phone is a microphone and camera. Well, now they're going to have arms and legs, and they're going to be awake, and they can open doors and pick up knives. So potentially, yeah, that's a really good question. Really good question by Amanda. You know, good job for the PTC staff there. Uh, Matt asked me, what about security, how it's going to be handled? Well, another organization I mentioned affiliation with in the beginning is I found an organization called the Association of Cloud Robot Operators. So we're looking at dealing with these issues um, and in a way that needs to really be trusted, because this thing, we need a, a trust level way higher than the internet. Um, people don't trust governments. They don't trust big tech. Sorry for some of you guys. They don't trust big tech, and the trends aren't, are, are unfavorable in that condition. They don't trust AI. And they don't, the other day, my son was talking to my, my nine-year-old son was telling my eight-year-old daughter, I don't like Alexa. I think she's listening to us. And Alexa said, no, I'm not. No kidding. <laughs> um, but... So we're really starting an organization that has no benefits to big companies and a lot of startups and stuff. But if you want to be involved, I'd love to have people involved. We're creating um, the, as best possible standards and processes, protocols, best practices to make sure the interfaces between robots are safe. So when you download the ability to, for your robot to do some kind of special service, crack an egg, make an omelet, make a dinner, um, it's not going to do something dangerous when it downloads it. And you know if you show up at someone's house with your kids, and their, and their robot is an acrobot, that's compliant with acro, it's gonna be safe. Uh, the third question I got, you know, it's four's too many, two's too few, so the, the number three here, I got a question from a guy named David. Uh, I think you're in that conversation. <laughs> What's a use case needs for 5G? And, um, you know, why can't we do it with the stuff we've got now? So you ma imagine a robot in the kitchen, and somebody says, hey, you know, I, got, I got this great rest, I had this great recipe last week, you know, at this PTC conference, whatever, some kind of meal for chicken. And the robot could determine what's in the refrigerator, if there's any food sensitivities, what ingredients are needed, vision going on between who, who's, who they're seeing in the room, what they're seeing in the refrigerator, and analyzing how we can uh, access other ingredients that might be needed. A um, lot of vision streams, and for that to be a human-like feeling and not like uh, something that's going to make us feel more impatient and frustrated, you know, 5G could really allow that kind of thing to happen like we never had before. So we're talking about, um, you know, round trip um, uh, returns on interactions with, with clouds somewhere on like 50 millisecond uh, um, objectives. So anyway, again, this may never happen, but a lot of things indicating we might be heading in this direction. If, if it does, give me a heck of a different world than what we've lived in <laughs> up to this point. This could be much more transformational, tran transformational than anything yet we've seen. 
So you got any questions? Love to talk to you some more about it. Thanks.